Hello everybody and uh, welcome to today's webinar, 24-7 um, remote mobile access to your entire practice. Uh, a few points of house housekeeping first of all. Um, speakers today, we've got our, our webcams on so you get to uh, peer into our, our homes and see where we're where we're, where we're working remotely from. Uh, you do have controls on those webcams, so if it does get a bit annoying seeing us uh, live, then you are able to uh, minimize, close down their options just so that you see the person speaking. Uh, or if you'd just rather see the uh, the slide deck, then you, you can turn our webcams off uh, for your own viewing, viewing pleasure yourselves. Um, Though we've got a lot of content to, to cover today, I do encourage you to uh, use the questions panel uh, that you should see within your GoToWebinar console. Um, do uh, uh, ask any questions as we go along. We'll try and cover off those uh, as, as they come up. If we, if we um, can't cover them off at the time, then we, we will have some time towards the end of the webinar to look at questions. Uh, if we do run out of time, then we'll we'll get back to you after the webinar itself. Um, okay, so speakers today, my name is Dean Shepherd. I'm the lead product manager here at Walters Clear with responsibility for our tax accounts and audit solutions. Uh, and I'm very happy to be joined by Ben Folds, who is the uh, business development director for our friends at Hosted Desktop UK. Hi, Ben. Good morning. So for those of you who, who don't know, Hosted Desktop UK are a specialist provider of cloud IT services, uh, predominantly in the uh, accounting industry. They've got uh, over 500 accountancy practices on their books, uh, many of whom, of course, are Walters Kluwer customers and use our CCH uh, suite of software products, um, as well as many other professional service providers and, and corporate clients. Uh, so I think it's fair to say, Ben, that uh, you guys know the accountancy industry pretty well. We do indeed. Fabulous. And uh, I, I myself was a customer of, of Hosted Desktop uh, UK for many years. So uh, I'm personally very pleased to uh, let everybody know that we've been working very closely with uh, with Ben and his team so that we can deliver our, our own uh, Walters Clue hosting solution powered by our friends at Hosted Desktop UK. Um, so let's take a little look at some of the things we're we're going to cover off today. Um, obviously, the title of the today's webinar is 24/7 uh, remote access to your practice. Um, so that's very important that I think we talk about the need um, for for remote access and the benefits of it. Uh, and a hosting solution is a really good way to be able to to deliver that uh, for your teams and in your practice so we'll we'll certainly take a look at that solution uh, and how how you can also increase uh, security uh, reliability and um, things like uh, backups replication retrieval of data in the cloud I know uh, whenever we talk to our customers about the cloud and, and data being in the cloud uh, security is a very key uh, part of that conversation um, particularly since GDPR has come into force so we'll we'll have a good good discussion about the, the issues around security. Uh, and we'll also look about how um, you can save time, effort and money with uh, implementing uh, remote access in your workforce and, and changing, perhaps changing your IT infrastructure. I know, um, I suspect almost every practice on this call will have made changes to their uh, IT infrastructure in light of people not necessarily being able to work in the offices as, as they once did uh, and I'm sure lots of people have in, incurred a cost they weren't anticipating um, but it, it doesn't have to be that way when we look at um, permanent a more permanent solution to to remote working um, so Ben I don't think there was ever a, a bad time to be implementing um, remote working in in the practice but obviously at, at this time there's a little bit more more pertinent need uh, for, for remote remote access to all data and applications? Yeah, there is, Dean. It's um, the the uh, number one reason that our customers um, say that they wanted to move to a, a, a cloud environment or a hosted desktop environment um, was uh, to be able to work remotely. Um, that is more prevalent than, than ever. I think um, 
remote working stats generally have gone from something in the region of 5% up to around about 45%. And post lockdown, when we go back to some form of normality, um, the, the general consensus is that the, um, the, the shift towards working remotely or giving people the option to work more remotely will probably be more widely accepted than it, than it was previously. Yeah, I, th I think that's um, I think that's certainly the case. I mean, when we moved to a, a hosted solution in my practice, we certainly didn't have the situation that we were in today, um, but we definitely had uh, a need for many members of our team to be working remotely, and that's not just uh, working from home, but also working off-site um, at clients or on the way to clients. Um, being able to access the, the full suite of applications and, and everything that an accountant might need um, was always a very, uh, um, very important to us, um, and and that's certainly why we looked looked at host, hosted solution when we were in practice. Um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is get a little bit of feedback from everybody on the call, uh, and I've got a couple of polls here that I'd uh, just like to to run if if you could take the time uh, hopefully it's the, f the first question has, has come up on on your screens uh, and it's just how satisfied you are with your existing IT setup uh, around the issue of remote working so I'm assuming there's probably um, uh, I assume most people on this call will have uh, made much more extensive use of uh, uh, remote working in their practice or in their business at the moment um, so it would be great to see how how satisfied you are with with what's been uh, implemented okay so just waiting for a few more answers to come in and once they start coming in um, I will share the responses on screen so so that you can see those I'm guessing things uh, got very busy very quickly for you in the the office, Ben, when this this all kicked off. It did. Um, there was both existing customers and and um, new uh, potential customers that were looking for or seeking guidance or support in one guise or another. Um, I think the uh, the the ability to deliver a remote managed service successfully uh, isn't always as as um, straightforward as people might have imagined so we had this scenario whereby um, organizations who weren't set up to have remote working uh, all of a sudden wanted that, that uh, ability um, organizations who had a had the option to work remotely but hadn't necessarily done it previously wanted a little bit of guidance around how uh, they should implement it and what best practices are and that included things like well-being for, for, for staff making sure that you you understand the uh, the needs of your your team and you, you're supporting them uh, in the best possible way so not just about the technology it's also about looking after the uh, the people using the technology great uh, hopefully you can see the results on the on the screen there so um, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, a lot of the answers are more at the upper end of the satisfaction scale so you have uh, in the majority of cases found a mechanism um, that allows your teams to, to work remotely. Um, the, the second question I'd like to ask is really about how, um, I guess, how permanent a solution uh, you think you have uh, in, in what you've been able to achieve in, in allowing remote working. Um, when I was in practice, um, before we, we uh, used the hosted desktop solution. Um, we had uh, we used a, a, a product called Logmian. So if you've, if you've not heard of that product, what it basically did allowed um, our teams to access their physical PC in at their desk in the office remotely, uh, and we did use that uh, fairly extensively at first. Um, but there were a lot of shortcomings uh, with that solution because all you're doing really is is accessing a live machine that's that's sat in the office so um, certainly if I was working uh, over the weekend or of an evening and I'm, I'm logging in uh, to my PC that's sat at my desk 
in my office, uh, it does rely on that machine actually being switched on, uh, not running an update or having turned itself off or, or anything like that. Um, so it, it wasn't a particularly reliable solution. Uh, and uh, when we had lots of our team kind of using that, um, particularly when they're out at, at clients, it can be a little bit embarrassing when you sat with the client going through through their figures on the, the laptop. Uh, and then you have to call the office and get somebody to reboot your machine and, and sit there for five minutes um, whilst you wait for that to come up and then you can can log into it again. So it, it was a, a very quick solution for us to implement, but uh, having used it for a little while, it certainly wasn't something we'd, we'd call a permanent solution. Um, do you see similar things, Ben, where people try to apply a solution themselves, but it doesn't doesn't really work for the long term? Uh, yeah, we do. I think these. I think it'd be remiss to, to suggest that that people don't have the um, the skill set um, to deliver a version of remote working. The ongoing management of that isn't always as, as slick as they um, they might have hoped, and sometimes it can be a little bit resource heavy. Um, if you've all of a sudden got an environment where uh, you've gone from five percent of of people working at home to sort of 95% of people working at home. It comes with its own challenges, everything from sort of a um, governance of the, the hardware they're using to people using their own devices, um, sharing laptops, et cetera, um, even working environments. So there's, there's plenty to, uh, to, to I suppose, um, consider when moving to it or big shift towards uh, um, working remotely or having the ability to work, work remotely. Yeah, and I, th I think the, the poll probably reflects that a little bit. So we, we had quite high levels of satisfaction for what's been implemented, um, but perhaps not quite as long term a commitment to the solution that they've they've got in place at the moment. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, really interesting uh, for us to see there. Thank you. Very, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for answering those questions for us. Um, OK, so we've obviously we're talking about hosting and, and hosted desktop solution uh, quite a lot at the moment, but this may be a completely new uh, option for people on the call. They you know, may not have heard of, of a hosted desktop uh, or even uh, what cloud hosting is and, and what options that gives you. Perhaps you could um, tell us what, what a hosted desktop is, Ben. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I suppose taking a, a slight step back, um, I think it's, it's clear that the technology market is awash with acronyms and um, buzzwords and, and, and probably um, a few too many, um, maybe designed to confuse people to, to try and um, ensure that they seek guidance or, or, or require the support that, that is offered. Um, cloud computing in its, I suppose, the, the dictionary uh, term for it is, um, is the practice of using a network of remote servers hosted on the internet to store uh, manage and process data rather than a local server or a personal computer. Um, but there's lots of different types of clouds. The the, the cloud proposition that that um, we refer to, that we we uh, provide to our customers, is a uh, hosting of private dedicated servers. So we we provide um, servers to to our customers that host their data and their data alone. Uh, we then um, provide a, a transit for them to access that data via a hosted desktop. So what they do on their laptop or desktop is view images of their data that's stored in a very secure data center environment. So we're not going to the, um, the, the security at this stage, we're going to that uh, later on in the presentation, but uh, for all intents and purposes, the, the process of, um, of accessing your data via the internet is ultimately what cloud computing is. Yeah. That's really interesting, and um, we were thinking earlier whether there's something we could actually demonstrate uh, from a software perspective of, of what a remote desktop might look like for the user. Um, but actually, for your user, if you are using this kind of solution, it, it's not going to look any different to, to what their current desktop looks like. It's just a case of, of logging in, isn't it? And they um, the, from that point on, uh, everything is is as it were. Exactly that. the The intention is to to replicate the existing environment, but put it somewhere um, more accessible, more secure, um, with more power. Um, all the, the, the the things you'd expect from a from a, a cloud provider, um, but with a from an end user point of view, a very familiar experience. 
Yeah, I remember when we implemented it, um, and we, we'll talk a little bit about the implementation process and, and the migration process and how that works a little bit later. But uh, I remember when we, we had our go live day, um, so we'd moved all our systems uh, into the cloud hosting solution. Uh, and there was a couple of people in the team that that were off um, during that process and, and came back to the office a couple of days later. So I thought I'd run a little bit of a, an experiment and uh, before they arrive at the office, log them in and see if they even notice um, that, that anything's changed. And actually, uh, neither of the team that I tried that on um, spotted any change they just kind of came in sat down cracked on with work uh, and it wasn't till uh, perhaps the next uh, day or when, when they came to log off that they they realized something had uh, had slightly changed but they weren't sure what um, but but otherwise it was it was the same experience that, uh, that, that they had otherwise there was certainly no training requirement um, in, in rolling this out um, obviously one of my um, concerns when I was looking at uh, implementing this kind of a solution uh, was the reliance on a on a super fast broadband connection uh, I, our office wasn't in the middle of nowhere but um, we didn't have the fastest broadband speed and I, I was a bit worried whether um, everything would suddenly be running really slow on our on our, our screens how uh, is that something people might experience? They shouldn't do um, the, the the transit to your data. So that connection into your data is um, is via something called a thin client. So effectively, what that means is you're on your desktop, on your on your PC or laptop, you are uh, viewing an image of um, your data sat somewhere else. Um, that that transit in doesn't download things to your desktop or laptop. So the fact that you're only viewing a, an image means that your data connect connectivity doesn't need to be significant for you to uh, to be able to run a perfectly um, perfectly good session as they call it um, alongside that the power in the actual laptop or desktop doesn't need to be significant either because all the power is at the um, at the other end at the data center end so uh, it enables people to to not spend heavily on their endpoints on their sort of laptops and, and desktops and invest in in other areas of their organization okay so it's really just capturing I guess keystrokes and and mouse movements and but all all the kind of the work's being done at at your end, so it doesn't need um, super fast connection. I do remember actually exactly. when yeah when we were in the office, um, even uh, we lost inter internet connection in the office. I think some builders outside um, drilled drilled through the internet connection or or something, uh, and I do remember then just tethering through the mobile um and it, it, it not making any difference everything still operated as it was um and certainly back then it wouldn't have been a, a 5g connection through through my mobile so um yeah that was uh, evidence enough for me i guess that we didn't need a super fast uh connection for this 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 to work um so that kind of explains what uh, what hosting is um i guess we really want to know what what the benefits uh, of the solution are see we've we've talked about um, being able to work remotely from from anywhere that's that's the kind of the main thrux of this this webinar um, and that's not just of course working from home that's that's working whilst you're out and about it's whilst you're um, working at clients I think before we implemented the solution um, we we're obviously still working at clients, but we'd be doing things like um, we'd just be taking the files we needed um, to work on whilst we're at the clients. And then when we get back to the office, we kind of load those um, back into the system. Uh, and not everything travels out of the office particularly well. So we, we'd always have those problems of um, you get back to the office, somebody's made changes at the office side of things, um, somebody else has made them whilst on the go, and, and things get get overwritten. Um, so I think for us, one of the big benefits um, was actually being able to work on the same data, whether you're sat at the desk in the office uh, or out and about at a client's. Um, another big benefit from our side was really on the IT support. Um, so as a 
relatively small practice. We we didn't certainly didn't have any in-house IT team, um, but uh, we we also didn't have great external IT support. We kind of managed try to manage all the IT stuff um, ourselves, and we were kind of getting to the point where uh, we haven't got the right people uh, engaged to to support. Um, the IT needs and we, we kind of felt our whole system was was held up by its bootstrings really. Um, what's what's involved on the kind of IT support side of things Ben what kind of stuff do you cover there? Um, everything from simply the operating system so just the infrastructure that we're managing right the way up to um, full remote managed service which is the management of the entire IT estate uh, for all things that can be managed remotely. Um, it doesn't tend to include things like um, replacing a printer cartridge um, or, or putting a mouse battery in a mouse. Um, but if it's if it's an issue that is preventing an organisation from working, then we we like to think that that's would fall under our remit, and, and we we manage that. Um, the the company is is, is born out of a um, a few guys who came from the accountancy application world. So these guys um, were delivering uh, projects for accountants implementing their accountancy applications um, when they decided to set up HD UK they the intention was to build a, a cloud a secure cloud environment taking into consideration what they believe was important to this particular sector but with an understanding of the applications that they deliver from the cloud so ultimately it means that as well as understanding how they can or sorry how they should be delivered from the cloud to ensure uh, optimum performance um, they also understand how the uh, applications work so from a troubleshooting point of view um, they uh, are in a very good position to to uh, first fix or to at least point in a direction uh, to get a, a very quick resolution 20 faults raised so from an application hosting point of view we're uh, uh, we like to think that we are uh, well versed in managing applications and and companies within the accountancy sector um, but then spreading that remote managed service wider um, I think it's fair to 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 point out nowadays that people the, the IT estate has spread so it used to be sort of your servers and your applications now it, it it does and rightly so include things like your communication um, and what underpins that which is your connectivity so our, our, our sort of product proposition um, encompasses all of those elements to to provide sort of a um, a, a almost a, a complete IT estate management service rather than just a cloud managed service yeah yeah, that's really interesting, and I think um, it's it was one of the big reasons that we sort of came together and formed this this partnership, really, because um, Walters Clear have been um, serving the accountancy profession for for over a hundred years, and um, it's it's what we're it's the sector we're passionate about, and um, our, our solutions always have the the accountant in mind first um and we always knew that uh helping our practices uh make a move to the cloud was was really important and it's something that we're doing uh with all our software solutions managing that process of, of moving them them into the cloud um, but we wanted to accelerate that really and work with uh, a company that has the same kind of values has the same knowledge of the accountancy sector as we do so that we can offer uh, a hosting solution uh, in in partnership um, really with a, a company that we're we're in total alignment with so it's it's really good to hear that uh, and I guess uh, that in terms of the the IT support side of things that includes uh, I assume that includes the installation of all the applications does it include running all the up updates and things things like that as yeah, well it does it's a fully fully managed cloud service so um we from the, the initial imp implementation so the understanding of the, of the applications that we'll be hosting the version numbers uh, etc the full migration process um but then ongoing the management of the applications to an extent we're not developers um we're not going to start um providing customization to applications but whilst we um do have that that set of knowledge and experience within our team. We're always going to um, provide that um, that management or, or um, support to to manage the application. With the CCH one, it's it's slightly different because we've um, 
I suppose aligned our support teams in a way that means that um, we're never in a position to finger point and say that's not us it's them um, it's it is a, uh, a very aligned um, process in terms of either us receiving a support request or uh, Walters Clue receiving a support request between the two teams it'll get resolved yeah and I think it's really kind of power up um, the support that we're going to be able to provide to our, our customers uh, having our teams working working so closely on that one um, I guess another another thing that was really important to for me in practice was the um, the backup process that we used um, and I have to say we didn't have uh, I was never particularly comfortable with um, our backup process in the office um, we, we for many years had a, a tape drive backup system that we'd have um, somebody who was responsible for, for getting that running at the end of each day. Um, they did assure me that regular checks were done to make sure that we generally had retrievable data. Uh, I was never quite convinced it was as retrievable um, as, as perhaps I was being told. Um, would I still need to be doing this kind of daily backup process at my end or, or is that something that's included as well? No, it's, it's part of the service. It's um, we we back up uh, hourly for a day. We back up daily for a week, weekly for a month, and monthly for a year, and that's rolling. So it's a year today, it's a year tomorrow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it's I, I think backup and replication tend to uh, be conflated somewhat. Um, I think they they get banded together because they're sort of deemed to be a similar same sort of thing. They're different in our world. So the backup is us uh, providing no that backup and speed of, um, of restoring data. So if data is lost, it can be restored very quickly. Uh, that's the point. So you, you may have a very comprehensive backup service, um, but then the ability to restore that, that data if it is lost, that's, that's where the, the comparison tends to, to fall in, in our favor. Um, the replication side is slightly different. So when we talk about replication, what we refer to is the uh, replication of your live environment. So if we build a, a, a private dedicated um, server environment for an organization, those servers have a secondary server replicated, ready to receive the data in the event that there's an issue with the first server. So that's more from a resilience point of view rather than a backup point of view. This is the failure, they call it failover, but so if there's an issue with the first server, it failover both on an active, active environment. And then in addition to that, there's a secondary data center, which is 150 miles away with the same setup. So from a resilience point of view, we we um, we recognise that in this sector there's a lot of fear and, and the importance of availability is, is prominent. So the environment we've built is such that it provides as optimum availability uh, as possible. Great. Um, and that probably leads on quite nicely um, to our next slide about, about security, um, really, because as, as I mentioned earlier, um, security of data, particularly client data, but, but also practice data um, has always been an important issue for accountants uh, in practice. Um, obviously, we're a couple of years now into GDPR and that's kind of raised or heightened um, the awareness of, of risks around data. Um, and I know in, I, I know many practices feel that um, moving data uh, out of their physical office, which may be reasonably secure, uh, into a, a cloud environment might be less secure. Um, what sort of things do you have in, in place to address the security of data? Yeah, so again, in line with the um, the, the sector that we are, we, um, are heavily um, aligned to, we recognize that the uh, importance placed on the security of their data again is of the utmost importance. So we, um, the hosted desktop system to cloud that we we deliver is uh, are kept in two of the most secure places in the world. Our, our data centers are a, a state of the art nuclear bomb proof bunkers, um, which were designed to protect command and uh, and control systems in the event of attack. So the, down in uh, Greenham Common um, and Ash in Kent, but they are actually former Ministry, Ministry of Defence sites. Um, and if you have ever had the, I suppose, mispleasure of having a tour of a data centre, because it 
it is boring. There's no two ways about it. Um, and I've, I've seen many a data center. Of all the data centers I've seen, this is probably the least boring. Um, and I say least boring as opposed to interesting because it, it still isn't interesting. Um, but the point is, it is a former Ministry of Defense site. So one of the sites used to be um, where they would monitor the skies and the other site was would where they, uh, they held the cruise missiles from. Um, so a lot of that and nostalgia still remains in the site. So from a, a physical um, security point of view, it's a purpose-built armored nuclear bomb-proof bunker, a 3.5 meter high perimeter fence, um, three meter thick reinforced concrete walls, 24-7, 365 on-site security, which is ex-military and police, uh, solid steel doors, Ministry of Defense trained guard dogs, CCTV with 24-hour recording, um, the, there's no unescorted access. If you drive to the perimeter of it um, and hang around, you'll get questioned about why you're there. So it's a, it's a highly secure environment, I suppose is the point, um, and it's unlikely to be replicated. In terms of securing your data, this physical environment is unlikely to be replicated by any private organization um, just because it's so so vast and so significant. Uh, but then from a sort of a, a, a virtual side of things, the, the I suppose the security of the uh, environment, the IT, Piece. It's, it, there's uh, multiple servers, uh, switches and, and, and SANs, which is just storage area networks, uh, multiple firewalls with perimeter scanning, antivirus, anti-spyware, intrusion prevention system, content filtering, uh, as I said, the complete backup replication of the entire systems between two sites, between two bunkers, as they're called, um, RAID 5, 6, 10 system order servers, um, hot spares, is a lot, again, buzzwords terminology. But ultimately, it's it's a built it's an environment built to provide peace of mind that it is um, you're in safe hands effectively. So you can forget about the security of your data and the, the I suppose accreditations or governance that you need to adhere to uh, as part of your own job from an IT point of view and focus on um, the I think ever changing governance of of your own sector. Yeah. Um... Well, I think that point's very clear, <laughs> clearly made there, Ben. I, I don't think, um, certainly in in my former practice, we could have invested in in anything ourselves that would have given the same kind of level of of security over that that data as as you're able to do as an organisation. Um, and I guess the other point. Just on that, Dean. Me, sorry, just yeah. just to ju just to jump in, Dean. Um, I meant to point out the go along with that sort of rise in remote working. The uh, I've been reading a couple of articles around um, security of of um, of data when working remotely, and there is a uh, an expected rise in um, data breaches as a result of people using um, their own devices or working remotely, and probably not being quite as secure as they might have been in the office. And ransomware is a uh, ransomware attacks are, are, are rising constantly. The stats are, are showing that they are becoming more becoming more frequent. And it is a bit of a myth to to believe that ransomware only affects the, the large corporates. Uh, I think it's like 76% of ransomware attacks or successful ransomware um, attacks are on uh, small and medium sized uh, organisations. And also the I think in the states particularly um, the the cost of pay, from insurance point of view, the cost of paying out for downtime versus paying a ransom for ransomware attacks is greater. So effectively, insurance companies are paying out ransom rather than even look at the uh, the cost of downtime, meaning that they're almost funding cybercrime, which is a bit of a scary thought. Um, but it's, it's prominent and it's it's something that we say to, we like to be able to say to our uh, customers. Well, it's it's a bit of a minefield. Don't you worry about it. We've we've got you. Wow. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, it's an interesting point you make about about small small firms being just as affected by this as as large firms. We, I guess, uh, in my practice, I didn't feel, although I was very um, sort of conscious about being very protective over my clients and their data. Um, at the same time, I didn't feel like my clients were particularly in the public interest or would be subject to um, people trying to find out information about them quite in the same way that uh, higher profile clients of a larger practice might be. Um, so it is interesting to hear the statistics on that and, and how small firms very much are at risk from a security perspective. Um, I guess that kind of nicely brings on to the, the next point we could talk about is um, 
really is there a, a type of firm that this is suitable for um, I mean certainly all the things we've discussed seem relevant for all firms and we're certainly very relevant for um, my small practice but if you've got a, a larger practice that um, perhaps has a, a larger budget for, for IT and uh, perhaps has in-house uh, IT people is is this still relevant for them is this still an opportunity for for them to take advantage of a hosting solution it can be um i think we it's not one size fits all so i think our approach is to um provide uh organizations with enough information for them to make a, a best informed decision i suppose when you are engaging with the larger organizations they tend to have more it resource so at the, at the smaller end they often have either little or, or no IT resource, or there's a strain on that IT resource. Um, typically in the financial services sector, which is a bit of a broad brush, um, but the IT to staffing ratio is about one to 15. So for every 15 staff, one IT person. And that, that sort of is seen as, a, um, as, a, as an average across the, the field in terms of what is needed um, to ensure that, the fun, that organizations in this sector uh, have what they need to continue working uh, from an IT point of view. For the larger organizations where we've had the, um, I suppose, most compelling discussions is when they have a, a desire to um, redeploy their IT staff. So rather than having staff just tasked with keeping the lights on or managing um, the employees support requests um, for IT support, they can look to have uh, members of staff engaged in projects that might um, bring additional productivity into the organization or um, ensure that they are more accessible for their customers or providing a bit of a cutting edge over their competitors. So there's there's different ways in which organizations will look to to um, find that edge and uh, often that does leverage the, the IT team. Now, if they are tasked with um, just keeping the lights on and managing the server environment, often they're too thinly resourced to be able to focus on, on that as well as managing uh, product projects that might uh, fit it more in line with the organization objectives, whether that's growth or, or um, consolidation or um, whatever it might be, whether it's just improving the, their customer's experience. Um, so there is a there's a need at, at, at all levels, and we've have we we have regular conversations um, with with large organizations looking to do uh, that 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 very thing. Uh, more recently, with a an organization who they provide consultancy to, they've got a team around eight or nine IT people. Um, they're a little bit stretched, but they provide IT consultancy to their um, to their customers, to, to, the, to the organizations that they work with. Um, as part of that consultancy piece, it, turns, it brings in revenue to the organization and they're looking to do more of it. So their compelling event is to do more consultancy work and effectively turn their IT team into a profit center rather than a cost center. Um, so, and by, by outsourcing, uh, large elements of their IT management, they're able to do that. That's really interesting, Ben, because um, actually what we're seeing across the accountancy industry and have seen for some time is an expectation amongst clients, certainly that accountants are able to offer uh, more and wider valuable services to help their business, but actually a wider understanding um, of, of the technology needs of of their clients and actually if you're able if you've got uh, some of that expertise within your organization already uh, and you're able to I guess lighten their load on the day-to-day -day maintenance side of things and um, have them um, work with, with work with customers and help them with um, their technology needs uh, that's that's a really interesting differentiator perhaps uh, against what other accounting practices are, are able to offer um, and obviously, there's a there's a there's a, can, a change in the kind of cost setup as well, isn't there? So um, obviously, you've got your ongoing kind of IT maintenance costs with within a business. Um, but when we were looking at alternatives, um, we were kind of comparing a hosting solution against uh, having our physical servers in the office, which, uh, as well as being maintained, that's, that's obviously quite a significant. Um, capital investment um, that I guess I think we were told we'd be typically having to replace our servers every five years um, so it's a significant outlay um, every five years for our, our business and in terms of 
costs is there any kind of initial um, capital investment or, or are we looking purely at a, a kind of monthly billing model yes yeah, it's primarily an, an opex uh, piece so it's a monthly per month cost and uh, scalable so you you consume what you want so you you, you have you add more users take take users away uh, as needed uh, within the contract term so it's not um if you start off with 50 and need to reduce to 40 um you're not held to to 50 users over the course of a, a contract return um i think the, the cost comparison is a, an interesting one because comparing a um a cloud service with buying traditional on-premise servers um, the cost comparison over the three year is is about comparable over five years it probably works out cheaper if you're comparing a server versus on-premise um, but that's it but that's not like for like so what you're not comparing at that point is cost of management power um, energy remote working potentially if, if you've not set up to do that side of things um, and from a resilience point of view it's, it's almost an insurance so we spoke about how resilient our environment is we we duplicate what we've built so we're effectively building two lots of of that server environment ready to be ready to be live uh, if needed so when you when you take into consideration all of the factors associated with outsourcing versus on premise then the, uh, the the return on investment tends to be significant not always but like i say we um uh, we we like to to approach it in a way to put organizations in a uh, position to make a best informed decision rather than dictate this is the thing to do great yeah i do do remember um in my practice we probably replace um machines roughly every every three years three or four years something like that uh and we we would have machine failures and hard drive crashes and things uh and that would you know typically take somebody out of the business at, le at least for a day trying to to sort that out and you know if the, if the machine has genuinely died a death then we have to get another one in and set it all up um for the, the team member that uses it so it really was a big um a, well a, a big piece of downtime for that that particular team member and whoever's trying to help them sort it out uh, I, I do remember when we switched to a hosted solution that um you know we'd, we'd still have technical failures with our equipment that we're using but we could literally just have somebody then log in to to another machine um access their their data their applications the desktop exactly how it was um before so there's there's no downtime at all for for the person doing the work uh and actually we uh, i found it um i probably shouldn't laugh but i found it quite amusing uh and we were in a, a shared office so there was lots of different companies working in our office and it wasn't the most reliable um electricity system i guess generator system in in the office so we we would get power outages from from time to time and there were certainly other um businesses and other accountancy practices in the same building that uh, any time the the power went out they'd literally have to call their it guys to come out and and wind up their server and get it going again and, and then literally the whole practice is sat there doing nothing whilst that's going on uh, and even people that um didn't have that problem uh they were hit by a power outage and they they'd lost whatever work they, they happened to be on that they hadn't saved at the time. So they at least lost a, a couple of hours work, if not the morning's work, uh, whilst they're waiting for their machine to boot up and, and figure out whether uh, they've been able to retrieve anything they were working on. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas from us, as soon as the power comes back on again, we just log back in and everything is, is there as it was uh, as it was before. So that was uh, certainly a big benefit from, from our perspective. Um, we've, I guess we've, talked quite a lot about the, the benefits of, of this as a, an alternative to solution to what people might might have in place at the moment um, but how do people get from where they are to to this kind of cloud uh, solution how, how would you migrate your your practice from having a server in the office to, to a cloud hosting solution so it's it's um devil's in the detail with this so i think there's two two aspects to it the understanding of the current environment is is key so uh, getting good knowledge of the applications used the data um, that they've got 
um, and how things are set up currently enables us to provide or build an environment fit for purpose. Um, and that, that the knowledge of the application is, is the key to that. So understanding how applications work is, is one thing looking at the resource requirements of an environment one day. Um, if you understand how certain applications work, you recognize that those resource requirements might change. When I'm talking about resource requirements, I'm talking about the things that power the machines that, that you work on. Um, so if you're in a, a scenario whereby you've got a particularly resource heavy um, application that if more than a few people access it, it all of a sudden grinds to a halt, that's the kind of things we, we're trying to avoid. So we set it up in a way that, that mitigates those types of risks. Um, but the, um, the in terms of the process of, of migrating or setting up a, a cloud environment, um, it, it will probably come across as quite a, even maybe antiquated to an extent, um, because we don't migrate data over the internet or very rarely most of the data that we import into our cloud environment is um, is uh, is sent via a, a hard disk so we would send a we, we would send a hard disk to a site and we'd back up the data over the course of a week or so um, we would then take that hard disk courier it to our it's an, it's a very encrypt it's an encrypted data a hard disk so there's there's a lot of security around the actual uh, hardware um, but that, that hard disk would then be couriered to our data center um, where the data will be uploaded into a, a ready and waiting environment. So that'll be the environment that we've already specced um, to meet the requirements. Once you've loaded the data into that environment and have the applications already sat there loaded, um, we then spend a, a fair bit of time testing and making sure it's ready to go live. And then we go live. Um, the, the beauty of doing it that way is that firstly, we're never in a position where you're trying to um, send data over the internet via a, um, a particular app or bit of software, um, because we, what we don't want is, is corruption to data or, or any sort of uh, scenario whereby that data could be lost or couldn't be rolled back to the original. So by taking a copy, we have a second lot of data. And when we import that into our system and set the systems up, if there's a problem with it, then we can, you've still got your working environment. So the steps uh, we take, the, the way in which we um, we manage this process is all around uh, the, um, first of all, mitigation of risk, but also to ensure that uh, you are in a position not to have downtime or, or um, loss of availability of your environment, whether it, we have to roll back to the original, whether or not you have the, the, the live uh, cloud environment from day one. Um, it's very rare that we ever have to roll back to the, uh, existing environment, the on-premise environment, but the option is there. So it's a bit of a, a safety net. Okay, cool. Yeah, I remember when we um, sent our, our data on that, that encrypted drive to have it have it put on the servers at your end. Um, I, th I think we set that running of a, of a Friday morning, um, told the team we, we're going to have a team training day, um, off, off the data went um, for, for you guys to do whatever jiggery pokery magic you do at your end uh, and then early the following week it, it was there for us to to use again um, what about emails during that time are we going to lose a, a week's worth of emails whilst that's taking place How does no, that work? The, the email process is even simpler um, and it it differs on what type of system you're using so if you've got an on-premise exchange server then you could either move to an Office 365 equivalent or um, you'd move to a multi-tenanted exchange, um, which again is in, in our, in our uh, cloud environment. Um, but the same process applies, everything's backed up. Um, there's a what's called a repointed of MX records, so knowing where the email should, should be going to. Um, the way in which it's done is to ensure that um, if there is a problem with the new way of working, you've still got the old way of uh, to fall back on. And at no point are you only ever um, working on one set of data or have any single point of failure. Okay, and I'm assuming you guys can handhold us through this through this process. Yeah, it's it's. I'm given a very I suppose bland generic example of what a migration process looks like, but in truth, my, no two migrations are the same. Um, so the the early phases are all about the um, the engagement with the, the customer uh, or the lead at the, the the customer's site to understand the the full profile of the organisation. So there's a lot of work done beforehand. There's a lot of work done behind the scenes in terms of setting up a cloud environment, um, and all is designed to ins to ensure a smooth transition from uh, what was to to what is the new uh, cloud environment. Okay, great. Um, 
so we've covered covered a lot of things there. Um, I thought it might be useful to have a little bit of a recap um, and and look at the I guess the top ten um, reasons we think customers will value um, the Walters Clue hosting solution um, powered by our friends at Hosted Desktop UK. And this is this is based on genuine. Um, feedback from existing customers about the things that that made the biggest difference um, for them. I think a lot of them, is, is, a lot of these will just be a recap of what we've covered. Although there might be some some things in there that we perhaps didn't cover. Um, I think we went into quite a lot of detail about the the levels of physical and uh, virtual security over the data. I don't think I was left in any uh, two minds as as to whether my data would be more secure. Uh, locally in our premises uh, or hidden away in a, in a bomb-proof nuclear former MOD bunker. Um, so I, I think we've we've probably covered that one quite quite well, Ben. But it's cer certainly um, very important to yeah. To the, me, the, the protection against EMP electromagnetic pulse blasts isn't because we expect there to be um, that sort of threat, um, but it's legacy and it's there anyway. Yeah. Great. Um, I mean, this is the thrux of the, the webinar, isn't it? Being able to access applications and data from anywhere. Um, this this was always always a big driver for me before before the current situation we're we're in, and there, there were other solutions that we looked at and other solutions that we implemented, but we wanted something um, that's that's robust, uh, is is good for the long term, uh, and and also would scale. With our business, we probably didn't um, go heavily into how easily this this system scales. But actually, when we had uh, new joiners and leavers, it was it was a very straightforward process for for giving them access uh, or removing access um, when when that time arose. Certainly, a lot lot quicker and easier than than setting up a a physical machine and installing every application they would they would need in the office. Uh, experienced IT support to to the professional sector. So um, again, this is I mean they're all they were all key drivers for for my decision in, in practice. But uh, if I had to pick one for me personally, I think this was it. I was never entirely happy with IT support that we had. Uh, I, I felt they didn't. Um, they came. They kind of assisted in times of emergency, but but we really took care of a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff ourselves, um, particularly things like installation and updating of, of applications and, and the myriad of, of, of software that we, we had in our office. Continually keeping those things up to date was, uh, was a real drain on our, our resources. Uh, and just actually having all our teams being able to have access to all the applications that that they needed and the right versions of them and not having that responsibility on our shoulders. Um, I, I still remember hunting around the office to find which machine still had the 2005 version of Sage 50 accounts on there so that we could do this um, one job for the one client that uh, never felt compelled to up, update it. Um, just just things like that were so much easier with, with um, proper IT support and people actually know uh, all the applications that accountants use. Um, certainly, with previous IT support, we'd have applications that, that, although they're perfectly competent IT people, they had no knowledge of the application. Um, they'd all, if if there were any issues with the application and connecting it to databases and and things like that, they just didn't. They hadn't come across them before. It was, it, you know, I'd have to be liaising between them and the software support. Um, whereas with with this solution, with um, you know Walters Clear's background and and hosted Desktop UK's background in the accountancy sector, uh, I suspect it's quite unusual now, Ben, for for your guys to come across a application that hasn't isn't already installed on on another customer's setup. Yeah, few and far between. And most applications follow a similar sort of pattern to to, to set up. So um, if it's if it's an application. That is part of the uh, initial setup, so it's already an existing application. Then 
we'll make sure we understand how it works um, before um, providing that cloud service. If it's one that they, it's a new application that they're wanting to implement, again, we'll get a decent knowledge of it first of all, because um, it just helps with the support process. Yeah. Are you also able to sort of restrict who has access to, you know, which users have access to which applications? Yeah, there's full admin rights, so you can you can be as um, stringent as you as you need to be in terms of locking certain uh, users out of certain applications. Great. Um, yep, the backup and re replication. I think we talked about that um, quite extensively. It, it was one of those things that was always on the back of my mind. Um, in practice, I felt like I was kind of just doing enough, but you know, God forbid something actually happened, I, I, I think I would have been in a little bit of trouble in all honesty. So that, that was certainly very reassuring. Um, the, the reliability of the system that, that gives peace of mind. Uh, I think that was an important one that um, sort of cross, crossed my mind um, about kind of levels of uptime. Are there likely to be periods of time where the um, users can't access the system? Do you have like a uptime percentage? Or? Uh, yeah, our, our, up, our uptime availability stats are available and um, we've got better uptime stats over the last 12 months than both Azure and AWS. Um, the the, the finance, financially backed SLA, so um, they're around 99.999% as an uptime availability as, as a financially backed stat. Our actual stats are 100% for the last uh, 12, more than over 12 months. Okay, great. Um, Speed and performance, uh, I kind of feel that goes without saying, given given the investment things at your end. Um, I think I, I must admit when I first started using the system, um, as I mentioned before, the we didn't have great um, broadband connection speeds in in our office, and the machines that that we had certainly um, weren't particularly high performing machines or high performing drives. Um, but when we would log in, we're effectively using your computers and your systems that, that are very high performance uh, and have um, much faster broadband connection speeds for things that I'm, I'm needing that, that kind of connection for um, remotely. So that, that was something I hadn't particularly thought of, but certainly noticed straight away as soon as as soon as we logged in and started using um, the hosting solution. Um, costs, we've had, we've had a few questions come in on costs actually, so I, I think we'll we'll cover that. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the Q&A uh, once, once we're through these. Um, but uh, as Ben mentioned, I think we you would see um, that it, it, it will save money, perhaps in, in a number of different ways. So we've uh, kind of covered moving uh, away from a capital expenditure model every three to five years, however that long that may take you. Um, the IT support is kind of built in to the the monthly subscription and that, that scales up and down with with uh, the number of team members you have. Uh, and also if I remember rightly, I had some part-time team members that so they were, um, we would charge like a part-time rate uh, for them if you like, so it wasn't the, the full fee for the team members that weren't using the IT systems full time. Um, only pay for the services you need. Again, that's that's this kind of scalability point. It's a it's a per user charge. And um, actually, we haven't really talked to, talked about costs, and it's uh, it's it is going to vary slightly depending on on, on what it is you need. Um, the the prices start at thirty pounds um, per user per month. Uh, and that's that's for the hosted desktop itself. Um, when I was in practice, we also um, wanted hosted desktop to manage things like Office 365 license and that kind of thing. So so we added that um, to our monthly user. Uh, I think there are also options uh, that we could have taken up to uh, increase um, the backup side of things. Is that Right, Ben. Yeah, there's um, there's a few little bolt-ons um, depending on what, what what the requirements are. So, um, but it's quite a straightforward. Everything's line items, so it's none of this sort of um, 
pay pay an amount and not quite sure what you're getting. Yeah, and every, everything was a per user subscription as well, so we always knew exactly uh, how much we were paying. And in our, our practice, our practice, we moved to a subscription model for all our uh, clients as well. So we 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 didn't have uh, we didn't really have any annual annual charges. Everything was done as monthly subscription, uh, and it made it very predictable for our clients to know what they're being charged from us. And at the same time, we wanted that that from our suppliers as well. So it's very predictable what the the charges would be, and those no surprises um and that, that's the kind of the nine point as well there's, there's there's no kind of hidden extras you um you choose what you need look at look at the uses you've you've got um whether quick you want... point on that one dean sorry yeah. just to jump in is it's not a consumption-based service what i mean by that is that if you require more power to make your applications work you're not going to get charged for those increases in uh, ram or cpu or whatever else you need to, to make it work uh, which is contrary to some of the public cloud propositions and um, ours is, a, is what we class as a managed cloud service so it's our responsibility to make sure that our, our customers can work as they need to great uh and yeah certainty over over cash flow um certainly with any it investment even if it's something like a, a known or something predictable like that you you're going to need to reinvest in new servers every, every five years or or whatever whatever it might be there are always things that um sort of catch you on a unawares or, or perhaps servers don't last quite as long as you an anticipate them lasting um there's certainly um certainty and, and predictability over uh, the cost of of, of this host hosting solution um okay so we have had some uh questions come in so i'm just going to uh open up the panel a little bit so we can go through some of these. Um, so the first one we've got here, we have got people on the line that are already um, Walters Clue CCH customers, uh, long-term customers, and also currently customers of, of Hosted Desktop UK. Uh, is this a new service? Is this something that we need to change or continue as we are? Um, all, all people that are currently both uh, hosted desktop and Walters Clear customers carry on as normal. There's, there's no change to the service from that perspective. Um, this is a new partnership for us. We always wanted to offer a hosting solution to our customers. Um, so it's about us really aligning very closely uh, to hosted desktop so that we can deliver uh, a really best in class hosting solution for our customers and it doesn't matter if if this is something you're interested in now and that you're you're going to sign up um through us as as walters clue or whether you're you're a pre-existing customer um there's certainly no difference in uh, in pricing or service um if if you're either a new or existing customer um we've got a question this is probably one for you ben if you know this one uh, are the computers that the processing is actually undertaken on virtual machines they are virtual machines yep the um the way in which it's set up is with um dedicated hard drives so the file sharing isn't shared um the the virtual machines are, are private and dedicated per customer um but as a in a virtual environment okay great um uh, we've got a few people have been asked for example costs based on users uh, and numbers of users uh, as, as i said it will start at, at 30 pounds per user per month um, i would suggest in the first instance get in touch with your uh, walters clear account manager uh, they'll be able to go through everything with you and uh, give you a give you a pricing model for your practice um, we've had a comment rather than a question that i presume this pricing makes it uneconomical for a sole trader um no. i no i would i would say not it doesn't really matter how how many users uh you you've got the pricing model is is the same um i had staff in my practice but i was a sole practitioner uh, and a, in a in a small practice it was it was certainly a uh, value for money from from my perspective um got a question about the support side of things does this cover uh, local support or is this an addition and do you provide uh, support 24 7 uh, i.e will there be somebody um, able to fix problems uh, late in the evening if i was working if i was working late yeah so the uh, the local support everything's done remotely so it doesn't really 
local doesn't really come into it. Um, I think if there is a need for somebody to have somebody go to site, if it's um, cabling or something like that, it's a slightly different thing. Our uh, proposition for remote managed services is um, anything that can be done remotely <clears throat> is managed by our team. And in terms of uh, the 24 seven support, uh, it's based on criticality. So any, um, any issue that prevents you from working will be supported 24 seven. What you're not gonna get as part of the 24 seven support is if you want um, a name change, it will be logged and managed within the SLAs, um, but you're not gonna be able to speak to somebody um, of a night time for that type of scenario. So it's, it's 24 seven to ensure that you, you can work as, as you need to work. Yeah, and I have to say actually, uh, when I used um, this, the support, uh, uh, offered with hosted desktop, even if it was um, perhaps a local issue that was outside the remit, they were uh, very helpful and gave me lots of um, advice and things on how I could um, sort sort out any local issues that I've got. So um, I have to say it was a very good support support service that came with it. Um, is the solution available to purchase for existing CCH uh, customers? Yes, absolutely. Um, do get in touch with with your account manager. Uh, if you don't know who your account manager is, then um, just call us on the usual uh, support lines and, and we'll get them to contact you. Um, we do uh, have a web page that I've, I've put up there. It's got a really long uh, URL. Uh, if you don't want to note that down and, and type it in, then you can just go to the software section uh, of our website and under featured solutions we've got Walters Clue hosting. Uh, it tells you a little bit about it there and there's also a contact form so uh, you can leave your details and uh, we'll be in touch. A um, few more questions. Uh, yeah this is quite a good one actually we didn't cover this. What about local um, peripherals? Uh, things like uh, so we've got scanners, bank verification pads, uh, I guess scanners and printers are are the main ones that that's still all going to work okay? Yeah, scanners, printers, uh, all taken care of. It's part there's there's applications and software that we use to ensure that they they work correctly, and and our guys are well versed in um, in ensuring that they do work. Um, bank verification pads it differs depending on what is um, what be what's being used and what the requirements are. Um, there there's things that could be done. Um, so yeah, we've we have dealt with that in the past. I wouldn't like to say yeah, it's no problem because it does depend on the uh, on what the endpoint is. Okay. Uh, another question here. We've got multiple software packages uh, in use at the moment. Obviously, there's the CCH suite, um, Sage Practice Solutions, Sage Line 50. Um, can you pick and choose what's hosted, and uh, does, does it affect the price at all? Uh, you can, how many applications you host? Not not so much in terms of the price. The, we can host. Uh, everything. So typically an organization will look to put all of their applications in the cloud for continuity reasons. So if they're looking to get those applications working together, it makes sense that they're in the same place. Um, if an organization has bespoke legacy um, applications that they don't want moving to the cloud for one reason or another, which has been the case um, on a few occasions, more, I'm dealing with one at the minute, and that's, that's the case, um, then you can put certain applications in the cloud and keep other ones local. Um, but yeah, it's it's down to the, the preferences really. Okay, uh, and can we use more than one monitor with a hosted desktop? Yep. Okay, that was I've nice and easy. Mon the reason I'm smiling because I've broken my, my second monitor, so I'm waiting for a second one um, and I'm lost without it. So it's very frustrating, <laughs> but yes, yeah, you can absolutely use multiple monitors. Fabulous, and uh, the final question we've got coming in uh, about Apple devices, Macs, iPads, can we still use those? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it doesn't. We're not restricted to the to the to the operating to the endpoint operating system. So yeah, the the a lot of the management team are operating Max um, within our own organisation. So it's fine. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's all the questions that we've had in. Um, thanks everybody for for joining this, and and thanks Ben for coming on board with me um, for this webinar. Um, so. As I said, if you are interested in uh, the Walters Kluwer hosting solution, um, do contact your account manager and we can talk about it uh, more and, and provide you with a, a quotation for that. Uh, if you've got any other 
other further questions that sort of come to mind that you hadn't thought of, then do just drop me a line uh, and, and we'll get back to you with those. So thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.